Um, yeah, thank you. I did this last year. I was trying to remember what I'd said, actually. And I think, I think the main thing that people always wanted was my experience, wasn't it? That yeah. People found most interesting. Um, <coughs> I, uh, so I'll kind of start with that. I'll give you a bit of an idea of the jobs that I've had. And then I'll start when I was kind of at your stage uh, in the journey, if you like. Um, so I have been pretty senior in the BBC for quite a long time, so I'd say the chunk of my career work um, in journalism, uh, news and journalism, mainly uh, TV news, but across all platforms really, was um, in the BBC. They trained me, and I was head of the BBC in the Central North, and head of the BBC in the North West, and I moved the staff up to uh, Media City and Salford Keys. Um, and then I uh, had a career break. And then I've been, uh, more recently, head of media and PR for Oxfam Great Britain, um, which was responsible for all their external media and comms um, on a kind of global platform trying to get them into the news. And, and that's quite a tricky job, actually. Um, it was quite a political job. Uh, way trickier than I thought it was going to be. Um, so uh, that was most recently. And subsequently, I coach people. I'm a postgraduate in executive coaching and mentoring. And I coach people at executive level. I coach them about work. And I coach them about leadership. And the aim of the coaching is really whatever they want the agenda to be. But it's around their work and how effective they are personally as a leader. So I have quite a lot of experience, actually, of coaching leaders in all different areas of um, work, both in the arts and in science. At the moment, I'm in a big contract with the NHS, and I'm um, coaching clinicians, uh, senior clinicians, right down to practice managers of big group practices, and um, and it's really interesting work, and I love it, and I'm really, really fascinated with leadership, just generally, just uh, you know, I love it. And I love talking about it, and I like you know listening to other people's experiences. Um, but when I was at your stage, I didn't have any plan to get to a really senior level in the BBC. We did a bit, but I didn't have any, any plans at all. I wanted to be a journalist, actually. So at the time, I was um, I dropped out of the university. I'd got back into a university by literally begging. Um, I'd gone to Leicester University, and I was studying English literature. And really, I just wanted to be in the music industry because I was crazy about bands and I was doing lots of festivals and I ran all the gigs at my college and I DJed and I thought that's what I wanted to do. And then I had such bad experiences with these bands that I booked where I got harassed like you wouldn't believe so often um, by pretty much anybody actually uh, in the crew um, <coughs> or the tour manager or the band um, that by the time I finished, I thought it was one of the most unprofessional environments a woman would want to work in. And I thought, I am not going into that. And you know, although I don't think I'm going to be the world's greatest person in the music industry, it just goes to show because it's their loss. You know, I never went and worked for them. I could have worked for a record company or a band, and I probably would have been a great asset to them, actually. Um, but such was the climate and culture of working in the music industry in those days. We're talking <coughs> mid 80s. Um, but, uh, you know, it was, I just wanted to want to do it. Even then, I just thought, I'm not doing that. Um, you know, it's just horrible. Um, so I decided I wanted to go into a more professional environment. That's what I thought. So I thought, uh, I'm going to um, write to every woman, God, every woman in the BBC who's at a senior level. Because I thought, I'll go and work for them. Because I was quite extrovert and I thought, I like being in the bands and you know, putting the bands on. I thought, they'll, they'll, they'll be a job for me. And, um, and it was quite a short list, actually, of women who are at a senior level in the BBC. It was a very short list. So I only wrote about six letters. And, um, and then one of them uh, wrote back to me. And I thought, wow. Um, she was working up the road, and uh, I went to see her. And, uh, and I thought, you know, maybe I should do some journalism and become, go and work for the BBC in a sort of more factual environment, you know, something that's a bit grounded in something real, you know, not all this kind of music industry stuff, just something really real. And the minute I decided that I wanted to work in, in fact, in a quite a structured, factual environment, I found my <coughs> personal kind of career nirvana 
in the sense that it really worked for my personality. Um, it was absolutely the right thing for me to do, and I sort of stumbled into it. Um, so that's my kind of first lesson, is to really know yourself. Really know yourself. Really think about your journey and what you really like doing and what you lean towards as you decide which areas of work you're going to go into. I am actually quite straightforward. I am not. I dropped out of, I dropped out of university to do drama because I turned up and are there any drama students here? Because if there are, I'm really sorry. I'm just going to be a bit rude about drama. Um, but I turned up and people were kind of writhing around on the floor. And, I, and I've done quite well at drama at school and I just thought, oh my God, this is not me. I stood there thinking, I can't do this. And, uh, and that was my first kind of, oh, I've, I've made a mistake. You know, I've made a mistake and I dropped out. And, um, and I wasn't very good in a kind of, in an environment of interpretation like that. Actually, what I really liked was a non-interpretive a, a non environment, which was journalism. You know, you take the facts. And I really liked the BBC because it has quite ethical, strong guidelines. And that really worked for me personally too. I've got friends who work for different organisations, Daily Mail, <coughs> Telegraph, Sky, whatever. But for me, the BBC really worked. And so I then um, made sure I worked really hard for uh, the BBC locally. Um, and then I made sure I got on a BBC training course, which was really tough to get onto. And then um, I went into um, radio broadcasting, and I went into television, I did some reporting. I didn't really like reporting, I thought, oh, I don't really like this. I like being in control, um, and I'm in control when I'm producing content, when I'm sitting at the desk and, you know, all hell's breaking loose, and I can just say, well, we're going to run that one, and we're not going to run that one. Bring in camera four, no, forget the live, we're going to go to this. And I was like the orchestra conductor, and I thought, this, is, this suits me. Because actually when I was out on the road, I got really, really stressed really stressed. Uh, I, I used to go out filming, and it, I don't know if anybody's done any filming, but in the old days we had like a cameraman and a sound man, and you'd go out and you'd spend all day filming for a minute and a half. All day. And what would happen is, and this, at this stage I was working for the BBC in Birmingham, and, uh, and you'd get to four o'clock, and you'd finish, you'd wrap your filming, and then you'd have to get back to Pebble Mill, I sound so wrong. It doesn't even exist anymore. And, um, and I'd, be, I'd be riding through red lights to get back to the edit suite to edit. You know, there was no Wi-Fi, and you had this clunky old machines with this guy in an edit suite. It took you forever to cut the material. And it used to just totally stress me out. So I just thought, I can't do this. I can't do this. I, you know, I'm jumping through red lights. I'd get in. I wasn't writing well. I wasn't thinking clearly. But the minute I was behind the desk, if everything went completely pear-shaped around me, it didn't matter because I was in control. And so I began to realize that actually I was much better in control of my environment. So it became a sort of natural progression for me to get more and more um, senior. I, I started off producing programs, then I became the editor of um, news programs, then I became executive producers of lots of programs, and then I ran regions where I ran radio stations and um, TV news and online content and sports programs and political programs and whatever, anything that people wanted to watch in that part of the world. So it was kind of an interesting journey, and uh, the BBC fast-tracked me into these jobs because I was pretty feisty, you know, it was been quite full-on and quite upbeat, and always used to kind of, you know, charge along and get all my team to, you know, make great programs. And one of the things I think very clearly about leadership is that you have to know where you're going, okay? That's one of the main things, I think, about leadership, is you have to be really clear about your goals. Where are you going? And that works at any level. If you're just, <coughs> if you're just producing five minutes of telly, You've got to be really clear about what you want to put in that five minutes, how you're going to make it, who's going to get it for you, what happens if it all goes wrong. So you're really clear, even though the target's quite small in the, in the great scheme of things, 
you're very clear about what you want, and so you're very clear about explaining what you need to everybody around you. And um, and so, you know, when you get to those kind of quite senior jobs, you have to have absolute clarity about what, what you want, where you want to go. And so I was very clear about what I wanted from everybody, and BBC promoted me quite rapidly. And when I got to, I think I must have been in my early 30s, maybe 32, I can't remember, just to look at my LinkedIn profile, I, um, I got my first really senior job, which was head of the North region, which was this part of the world. And at the time, the BBC, I don't know which way this, way this building faces, I think the BBC was there, there wasn't it? Yeah. Woodhouse Lane, there's a, I think there's a plaque, isn't there? On the yep. building, Friends Meeting House. Yes, yeah, yeah, in that direction. So, so next, next door up, to course, podcast. I've been yeah. running all these new shows, and I've been running up down the gallery, and sitting there, and I knew what I was going to put out, and I knew what I was doing. And then I got my first job here in Leeds, and, um, uh, and I was quite stressed about it all. And uh, I, I moved my family, and we, we, I spent my first day sitting in Woodhouse Lane. And I remember thinking, oh, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Because I've got a TV editor, and the TV editor puts the TV news on, and I've got uh, station managers who run Radio Sheffield, Radio Leeds, and Radio York. <laughs> and uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't actually know what I'm supposed to do. I remember some cup of tea. I'm at a PA. Oh. Uh, and it's really interesting when you get to that level, you don't actually have anything to do in, re in real terms, you think. Um, because you're not actually operational anymore. You're operating at a completely different level. And no one had ever explained this to me. And so I sat there and... Uh, and <laughs> And then I got a barrage of problems, um, complaints, serious complaints, um, all sorts of things. But one of the biggest things I had to do was I had to move the staff out of Woodhouse Lane to St Peter's Square on the other side of town to a building that was being built at the time. And I, I think I must have had about nine, maybe nine or ten months before the building had been completed, so that it was going up, and all the staff knew they were leaving um, Woodhouse Lane. Now, I'd come from Manchester, um, and uh, I turned up at Woodhouse Lane, and I just thought, bloody hell, how can they work here? It's horrible. It was the most horrible building. There was no light. They kind of built it incrementally, and of course, the BBC had kind of grown. And it was very, uh, it was one of the first BBC <coughs> regional offices or newsroom. So it's really um, labyrinthine, no light, tiny little rooms, everybody was squashed up, there were rats, um, you know, it was a really, really unpleasant environment to work in. So I made, because I was quite, you know, I was like, yay, we're all going off to the other side of town, it's going to be brilliant, fantastic offices, you know, I know we all have to go digital, we'll all get lots of training, you're going to love digital, you're going to love working in a digital world, you know, analogue is really clunky, it takes you forever. <laughs> it's going to be fantastic. Well, I had 300 staff who, if they could have done, they would have just chucked two fingers up at me and told me to get out of there. They were the most, and they'd sent me there. It's, the BBC had sent me there specifically because they thought my personality would work with the team in Leeds. And the team in Leeds was the most difficult, most reactionary, awkward set of buggers you could possibly ever want to manage. And also, conditionally, if you manage journalists, they all have a habit, because they're trained to have a habit, of thinking that A, you're lying, as a personal authority, you're bound to be lying, because that's what you do, weaving out the truth. And, um, and secondly, they think um, that they can question everything, because that's what they do, they question authority. So if you've got really good journalists, the chances are, if you manage them, you're going to have a very, very difficult time. So I kind of knew this a bit, because I've been working with journalists, but I didn't realise quite how awful it could be. And um, so uh, <coughs> I tried to make lots of changes, and I found myself um, in lots of industrial disputes. And uh, I tried to persuade them about um, digital technology, more industrial disputes. 
I tried to take them to the building and show them this beautiful building where they're all going to be working. Didn't want to go. And I mean, they really didn't want to go. And, and, and all they made about was the fact that, you know, they would have uh, car parking problems down the other side of town. And, you know, and I just couldn't understand it. You know, I was, I would consider myself as a leader to be quite upbeat. You know, I tried to lay out the vision of how things should be for them and uh, how great it was going to be. And, uh, and then someone came to me, one of the team came to me and she just said, you know what your problem is, Tamsin? She said, why do you always think change is a good idea? We don't think change is a good idea. And I thought, God, she's right. She's right. I have come at this from completely the wrong perspective. I have not taken my staff with me. And I can tell you, on this list of things you're supposed to be, right, I can tell you I was very passionate. Didn't get me anywhere. I can tell you I was super confident. Didn't get me anywhere. I could tell you that I'm super resilient, didn't get me anywhere. I could tell you that I was very encouraging, didn't get me anywhere. Uh, I'm very hard working, didn't get me anywhere on this particular issue. Uh, proactive, well I bounced about a lot, they still didn't want to go. And uh, I was very determined, well that got me into lots of trouble actually because they just weren't with me. And I had to think about myself and for the first time in about a long time I started a totally different journey. So the first journey I'd gone on was really about getting to be really senior and the second journey I went on was really getting better at being senior. Like properly, properly different. Properly better, a more thoughtful, self-aware senior leader. And it's a completely different thing to getting there. In my opinion. And it made me think about my personal style and where I was most effective and where I really wasn't being very effective. And my goal, my clarity <coughs> and vision wasn't getting me there. But the way I'd approach my task wasn't getting me there. So I then had to go away and think, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? And I went on a, um, a leadership course um, at uh, Ashridge College, actually, which is quite famous and, uh, for leadership and business management. And I went on this course and, um, and, I, and I sat down and we had this talk, a bit like I'm giving you, and I'm going to share this with you because it's like a great story and I just thought, wow, that's fantastic. And I had a real light bulb moment. And it, you, you had to really analyse yourself a lot and when you were really effective and when you weren't. And this woman told the story about um, Hewlett Packard, who um, had been moving sites. And um, this woman was really, it's California, so they were bound to be a bit ahead, a bit progressive. <laughs> now they dealt with the staff. But anyway, they were moving to a different building, and none of the team wants to go because they were all in really tight knit groups of staff. They've worked together for years, they didn't want to go to this new building. And this HR director, who was really on it, knew about um, this change curve, a, a theory of um, change management, and um, she, uh, she decided to go through a process with her staff um, in order to get them in their mindset ready to move, and um, what she did was she took a coffin around the building. So she got a load of staff to carry an open coffin, which I think was pretty brave, from each room round the building, and all the staff had to rip a piece of paper and put in what they were most sad about leaving this building. And then they had to put it in the, they had to read it out, and then they had to put it in the coffin. And then they all went out into the car park and they um, got drunk and set it on fire. <laughs> Well, I just thought it was inspired. I just thought, well, that's where I've been going wrong. I'm just not, I'm just not listening. I'm just not listening to what they're really trying to tell me. That actually, they've been there for years. You know, they've been there for years. I'm this kind of dynamic person that comes in and tells them it's all the rubbish, and that it's all going to be brilliant over there. 
And actually, I just wasn't listening. I wasn't really understanding where they were coming from. And I totally changed my approach to try and um, inspire them to move. And the first thing I did was I said, OK, you know what? What we're going to do is we're going to celebrate this building. We're going to have a massive party. And we're going to get everybody who's ever worked here to come back here. We're all going to make videos about what we're going to miss about the building. We're all going to talk about its history. And then we're going to slowly move across to the other building. And when I did that, and I had a committee who did the party, and all these things that I was quite dismissive of, you know. <coughs> I mean, they were going to hold a bit of a party, but I just chucked tons of money at it at that point. Um, and made it a much, much bigger do. Um, and we got the Director General up to say goodbye to Woodhouse Lane. And, you know, it was a big deal. And it was really, really very effective. And I think the lesson for me, and the lesson for, and, and subsequently <coughs> I became, in, I have really invested time in really thinking about myself, um, my leadership style, where it's really effective, and frankly, where it's really not effective. And what you can do to kind of use um, to be self, really, really deeply self-aware. You know, my impact on people. Um, you know, I used to get told when I was younger that I was quite intimidating as a manager, and I used to think this was quite good. You know, quite helpful managing journalists if you're quite intimidating. You know, you get your way. And as I grew up, for want of a better word, I realised that that's actually really awful. That's a really awful thing to be told. And that, what does that mean for people who you're speaking to, who don't? Who, who find you scary, or, or you're not, you're not empathising with them, the quieter ones around the table. And you know, once you start to learn that about yourself, you sit there thinking, God, I bet that's true. I bet half the table just don't even, don't even speak to me. And then you think about it and think, yeah, actually they do. And uh, so I went through another process of huge change where I had to lose tons of staff. And because I changed quite a lot by this stage and become a a less full-on senior leader. I was doing a lot more listening, I was doing a lot more sitting down with people, trying to get in their heads and understand what was going on for them. Not what I needed, but in order to get them where I needed them to go, I had to get inside them and think, what, what's the best way of motivating you? Because it's going to be different from you, and you, and you, and you, and you. It's a complex thing, leadership. It's about understanding when to shift into something else, understanding what motivates one and what puts somebody else off. And I had to make a lot of staff redundant. And I went round and I spat, sat down with every single one of the two people who were um, vulnerable to, to redundancy and, and listened to them um, on the day I made the announcement. And it was actually really quite unpleasant. You know, they were all terribly upset. And I went home thinking, oh, you know, it, it was hard. But actually, from their point of view, um, they got to speak to somebody who they thought was actually going to have some sway over the whole process and could really explain why they wanted to keep their jobs and what was going on for them. And I can tell you, five years earlier, I would never have done that. So I think your journey into these jobs has to be matched with a journey of knowledge about yourself and what makes you <coughs> really effective and what doesn't and being really, really um, clear with yourself about what your strengths are. You know, when I coach now, I predominantly coach women, actually. I've got a specific interest in women in leadership. And one of the things I can tell you is, just to make you all feel better, because it is, it is an issue, is that at a very senior level, women mostly, I mean, I don't want to be too gender um, kind of stereotypical, but they really suffer with confidence issues, even when they get really, really senior. And you're working with them around things that you know they don't want to tell anybody else. Um, and they've got that senior. So those issues that you think you're worrying about now, you know, um, it's it's kind of things that can be addressed much younger. That's why I think you're it's very good to go into this programme now. It's really good to start to kind of think about these things at your stage because you can start to do small things that will give you confidence. You know, just attending this course will give you some confidence. So, 
you have to kind of think about that. What, what, are, what are your areas of strength? Think about all the things you're really good at, naturally really good at. And then think about how you can use them to address some of the things that you find difficult. And that's predominantly what I do when I coach people. I work with strengths, because I don't like talking about things we can't do, things we really don't do. I like to look at it from the points of things you can do, and then how can you use those things to, to, um, to find the things you find quite difficult. So for example, if, you're extremely, if you've got extremely good values of um, looking after your staff, and being very caring for your staff, and actually that tips into a kind of more mothering approach to management. You know, how can you use your, your care for your staff and look at supporting them in a different way? Um, and how, what does supportive mean? So I do a lot of work around that. But yeah, I mean, I think my journey is quite, it was quite an interesting one. And actually, when I went back to Oxfam, and went back to kind of full-time work and leadership capacity, I did think, oh, I wish I'd have known all the things I knew that now about myself, because I had a really nice time at Oxfam, I love my staff, I had a really great time, um, that I'd known when I, when I arrived here in Leeds, because I gave myself a very hard time, and I didn't need to give myself a hard time if I'd have sat back and really reflected on my management style. And I think that question is, you know, do you need to clone men? Is really, and it was very relevant to me, actually, because it was a long time ago. Um, and there was a sort of propensity to feel like you had to be like that, which for me wasn't that difficult, actually. Um, uh, it, was the, it was the other thing, it was actually being a, being a more listening, thoughtful manager that perhaps, you know, I haven't been seen any role models of, actually, a few. Um, that now you have a huge amount of role models, I think, that can give you a, a more, I think, a much more... Um, a less male approach to um, to management, um, and it is a, it is a myth. You need you need to be male. You know you need to clone a man. A man. Although there are different cultures and different organisations, and you need to be very aware of that culture. And you need to be very aware of whether you fit, think you fit in into that culture of that organisation. So that is something to be aware of when you're looking for career jobs. Make sure that they the, the feeling that you get when you go in the company works for you. Um, because sometimes you can find yourself out of sync with the culture of the organisation, you know. So that's another thing just to think about. But uh, that's it. That's that's me. I'm um, just going back to like the very start of your career <clears throat> when you said about um, you didn't you didn't find the like working in music was a nice environment for women. Like looking back now, do you ever think that you wish you stayed and changed that and not just like, you know, because like you didn't even you didn't get like women to work there. Do you ever wish you stayed and like changed the like way people look at women? No. Like, no. No, I don't really because I just think um, you, you could you could argue that I could have done and probably I was the sort of personality that could have, you know, bashed through it a bit. Yeah. But why should I? Why should I? You know, I just think you know they they, they, they missed out on talent, and that's you know whether they they probably all survived really well. <laughs> I can't remember. You know, from a different perspective, they didn't really deserve me. Yeah. You know, I think like I, I'm looking at it like in my career that I want to be, I'm working in male sport. They don't really want my opinion because I'm a woman, but I really want to work in Take the. Take them on then. Yeah, that's that's. Yeah, what definitely. I'm that, 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 if that's what you want to do and it works for you, that's fine. For me, it was it was more, it was around the utter lack of professionalism around right. it. You know, I'm quite a rule orientated person, so as well as all the kind of harassment I got, it's, it was a very very unprofessional environment. <coughs> that that kind of um, music business. Yeah. So it was it was it was sort of beyond just simply being propositioned all the time in the back of a truck. It was it was more about the fact that. Actually, when I went to the BBC and there was, you know, rules and, and, yeah. and structures, I really liked it. Um, I'm, I'm not so good when I'm outside that environment. You know, I like, a, I like to know where I'm at, you know. But it's a good point. You know, and there have been real pioneers um, in these organisations. And I'm, I had my own battles in the BBC, actually, believe it or not, but obviously not on the same scale as I would have faced in the music industry. But, you know, um, do you feel like your caring nature can sometimes be
taken advantage of by people when you're in a leadership role? Well, I think there's, you've got to be really clear about what you mean here. And a lot of my female clients get muddled, okay? And I think you've got to have real clarity about what that means. So does supporting your staff, I'll throw it back at you, a question. Does supporting your staff mean that you get involved in every aspect of their lives, you're sorting out their domestic problems, you know, you're, 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 you, you've got to have a degree of cut-off, what you call boundary management, when you're working like that. <coughs> so the muddle can come, and particularly in caring cultures, the one I'm working in now, like the NHS, for example, it attracts people who have a deep, a deep value. They can't get rid of it. It's in them. You know, you just can't get rid of it. It's nothing you choose. You know, it's, it's, it's part of who you are. It's a vocational drive to care for people. And that can go wrong in a leadership role. Because what happens is the staff love them. The staff, are, you know, they go to them every five minutes to tell them all the stuff that's not working and all the stuff that isn't right and how their cat's sick and, you know, I mean, li literally um, everything. And, and, and the leader is the one, and I've had clients who've drawn pictures of their staff for me, and all their staff are smiling, they're all really happy. And the leader in the middle is absolutely ragged. And they've developed something called learned helplessness, where they've just taken on all the stresses and strains of their staff. And so, <coughs> supportive, supportive can actually mean um, making your staff resilient, self-sufficient, problem-solvers. Sol problem and, you know, the best teams work when that, when that happens. And that empathy and that support comes when somebody has a real issue. I've managed staff who've been terminally ill. I've managed staff who's had, who've had children who've been terminally ill. And, 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 and serious issues where you definitely dive in as a manager, as a senior manager, and support that person. They might have had alcohol problems or drug addiction or something. So you can give them some support, um, depending on what's going on. Mental health is another good one. You know, you just you can. But there's a point at which you are. Um, your philosophy, if you like, of leadership, is that support means you make your staff self-sufficient, problem-solving adults in their environment, and that requires you to be. Um, to be pushing back some of that stuff that comes at you, to, that stops you becoming um, a go-to person for, and you're developing them. You're actually developing them. You're not you're not there for them, you know, as a kind of support for them. Um, and it's a, and like I said, it's these things are quite sophisticated judgments as to when you're going to turn around to somebody and say, you know, what do you think this, what do you think the solution is? I'm, I'm really I really know you can solve this. And then when they do, you see their confidence grow. So it's about really trying to develop your staff, and that doesn't mean to say you do everything for them. But but my female clients, and I and I, this is this isn't this isn't a stereotype. Predominantly, and I, and, and actually my male clients like this too. But predominantly, my female clients fall into that category. They get themselves into a, and it, and most of them, interestingly, have had male bosses who've been very, very unsupportive. <coughs> and they've had a complete reaction to that and thought, actually, I'm going to support my staff. I'm going to be there for them. You know, he wasn't there for them. And, and, and then it all goes horribly wrong. <coughs> and then they find they have to detach. And, and life can change around them. I had one client recently who had nurtured her team to the point she would run ragged. And, and, and her team loved her. And uh, she called herself Mother Hen. Okay? And then she was outsourced. Her team, were, well, her team were outsourced, and she had to stay. And when she told them, they turned on her. You know, they just turned on her. They gave her the biggest, hardest time. And you know, I was coaching her, and I and I was trying to prepare her for this moment that she got herself into kind of adult child with her staff, and that actually what what was happening was she was kind of abandoning her children. That's how they felt. And so they gave her a massively hard time. And uh, I knew it was going to happen. I was just waiting for the call. Oh, no. And, I, you know, she had a terrible time. And, 
So you have to be really careful as you go up into these roles as to really setting the boundaries of what it looks like for you in your environment, how it works for you, and be careful you don't step over the mark. And you can also fall the other way, you know, you can be not you cannot listen enough. You know? So listening is, you know, that was my that was my trap. Just a doer and not a listener, you know. I think we've got just one more. Finding a lot of the things that you're talking about, so like your coaching and things that you do. Um, as a youth worker, we have certain models of practice, like historic practice and coaching, motivational interviewing, um, and that's the practice and our service users. So, would you say that I can kind of use them skills effectively as a leader as well and apply them there? As Absolutely. Not just with, with clients. Yeah. What I want you to do is I want you to look at um, a series of leadership styles by um, a guy called Daniel Goldman. <coughs> and they're all um, broken up and they all look at different things. And what I want you to do is I want you to look at them and think, well, which one do I really feel I, I remember? And be really truthful with yourself. No point what you want to be, what you know you are. And then look at all the other styles and think, actually, are there moments when the other style is going to be really useful? So, for example, if you know you're quite consultative and you like to have a consensus, you know, when, when are you going to need to be more directional? You know, if there was a fire in the corner of that room, I would not be saying, you know, did you sure leave? I'd be saying, get out! Everybody out! You know, there are moments where you need to be very directional. <laughs> And it's how you enable yourself to move into those different areas when you have a very you have a you have a, a self awareness that actually you are very much one maybe two or three of these things, but you find it really difficult to be more forceful and more, more assertive. And then look at what that assert, you know what's going on for you that's, that stops you. What feeling like you're going to be. Most of my clients don't like to be assertive because they think they're going to tip into be seeming bossy or aggressive. And I find myself sitting there saying, you have no chance <coughs> of coming across as bossy and, and, and aggressive. You know, what does assertive look like? Assertive looks like clarity. It looks like, we're going to do this. I need you to do that. How do you feel about doing that? Have you got too much work? Can we do it? You know. I need us to go in this direction, I need to go in that direction. Not, not bossy, you know, not aggressive, dead straight, dead clear. You know, I'm frustrated that we haven't done this. It's, it's, an, it's about being very straight about what you're seeing and what you're feeling. And it's a very helpful um, tool to get people to realise that aggressive is shouting, swearing, not listening. And that generally the people who worry about that haven't got a prayer of going anywhere near it. And the people who are that don't know they're that very often. And you have to tell them that they're being too aggressive. And they're going, no, I'm not. There you are. <laughs> okay. I'm really sorry to have to wrap that up now, but I want to give opportunity for a, a bit of networking, which I was in just in a little break that we're going to have now, because I'm conscious that we've been here a little while, so we'll probably need a bit of a comfort break. So what I'll suggest, is we take five minutes to have a comfort break. If any of you have any additional questions, you'd like to ask some of them, we're hoping you'll be able to stay around for another five, 10 minutes. Um, and then we'll reconvene. We want to do a little bit of work around you just for another five minutes um, around International Women's Day and potentially get some photographs of you all um, and talk about how we might put out our presence as a collective on social media. So we'll be discussing that after the break and carrying on looking at different leadership styles and where we fit within those as well. So, but please join me in thanking Tammy for today.